This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's four o'clock. I'm Jay Fidel, and guess what? This is Think Tech. Yes, again, Hawaii, the state of clean energy, with Jay Griffin, one of the PUC commissioners. Wow. And <laughs> co-host, Jeff Ono. Wow. What a, what a team. This is great. Let's have a schmooze. Ready? <laughs> great. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. You got a lot of things going on at the PUC. We're so happy you come and talk about it with us. And one of the things that's in the newspaper the last week or so was Jennifer Potter, the new commissioner, appointed by David Ige. Um, and it's, it must be on the way to a confirmation right now. All, all the signals I hear are positive, no problem. Sort of like you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yes, I mean, the news came down. I, I commend the governor on his choice. Uh, nominee has a very strong background and experience in a lot of the issues that the, the state and the commission are currently facing. Um, so I again to commend him, commend him on his decision. As I understand it, uh, the confirmation hearing has been scheduled for April 12th. Um, so I imagine she is you know, going around meeting with senators, um, fielding questions on her background. Good. It's good when you put the confirmation in or the nomination in the middle of the session because then you can get confirmation that same session and <laughs> to worry about next session, you know. Hold Understand. On. Yeah. <laughs> the timing is important. So tell us about uh, Jennifer Power. You know her, yeah? I know her some. Um, I, if you look at her resume, in a lot of ways it speaks for itself. She's had experience working at Sacramento Mun uh, Municipal Utility District, uh, Municipal and Utility in Northern California, uh, routinely received some of the highest customer satisfaction um, grades and responses. Uh, she worked on a number of different programs there, but including, including one nationally recognized pilot project looking at innovative uh, pricing design programs for their customers. Uh, so this was something that uh, we were tracking closely here in Hawaii because were, these were topics that we were looking at at the time back in 2013, 2014. She'd worked on uh, another well-known well nationally recognized demand response study uh, while she was at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Again, something we were tracking closely. I was had the chance to meet her a number of times and interact with her uh, while she was attending conferences here. You know, our, our times at HNAI did not overlap, mm. um, but, you know, I have have met the nominee before mm -hmm. and gotten to know her. Yeah, and you know how things work at HNAI. I mean, you were there for a while. I was there back and forth between there and the commission. <laughs> So we have two now, two commissioners coming from HNEI, um, two wonks, may I say. Is that, is that okay? Uh, well, the Senate will have a say in that. I think, um, well, here, my perspective on it, one, I think one, it speaks, speaks to the Institute itself, the types of projects that are going on and the people that are attracted there. Uh, I think Rick has done a good job attracting people with you know, strong technical backgrounds but also because a lot of the work there is hands-on uh, demonstration projects. People, the people working there come with a lot of practical industry, you know, what I say on the ground experience. So if you look across the staff there, there are a lot of uh, decades of experience of former utility engineers working in the GridStar program. Um, when I was there, you know, Mark Glick had recently come back, so somebody with experience running the state energy office, John Cole, a former commissioner, if you look a little more broadly, there's a number of people with experience in the hydrogen uh, technology area, uh, marine resources. So again, people, there's a, a, a premium placed on people that may be viewed as analysts or wonky, but come with a lot of practical on the ground industry experience. Yeah, that's great. Great to have that. We need that. Uh, P.S., you know, you guys, uh, she's coming on our show on uh, uh, the Mina Marco and me show. On Monday, two weeks from next Monday, so oh, good. Wow. you get to say So hi, you'll get right? to yeah, <laughs> ask your questions in person. Well, how, how was your first year as commissioner, Jay? Can you tell us about that? Sure, I can, it's been, um, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's been an enjoyable time. It's a, it's a uh, demanding job, challenging in a number of ways, but incredibly rewarding. Um, I think I can point to some, I think we've, uh, made a lot of progress. We obviously have a, a large, uh, large number of issues on our plate. 
uh, important matters before, before, before us at the commission. But we have made a lot of progress in moving forward on the plans that the electric companies had set, uh, sent to us, um, you know, making decisions on those and allowing the implementation of a lot of the projects, the new programs, uh, new efforts to procure renewable energy. So it, it is rewarding to you know, personally be involved in making those decisions and seeing things go forward. To get to attend you know, groundbreaking projects of things that we had worked on and, and signed to see go forward. So that, that part of it is, is very rewarding. Um, it's, it was encouraging to come back and work, at the, work with the staff that we have there. Now it's a, it's a young, energetic, uh, but experienced and very talented staff that we have there. So that part's definitely rewarding also. So, you know, you had a certain concept of it before you went in because you were looking at it. You watched the uh, Next Era uh, uh, hearings and you, you saw that, you know, from various vantages over the years. Then you have a certain, a certain model in your mind about how it works. So my question is, how surprised have you been? What, what has surprised you when you actually took the chair, so to speak, took the seat? Well, see, I think the, in, in a lot of ways the job's more fun than I might have imagined in the sense that I, you know, when I was on staff before, you have a lot of management responsibility, a lot of time um, working individually one-on-one -on -one with staff. Now I have access to all of our staff. I uh, get to, you know, draw upon their insights. Uh, I get to probably spend more time diving deeper into the issues before us, you know, read uh, uh, extensively the filings. So I, that, to me, that's the fun part, um, dive into what's before us, you know, mm -hmm. think hard about what, what the decisions are, interact with my colleagues, and, you know, do, our, do the best that we have with the information we have and make timely decisions. I would imagine that all this helps you or even requires you to have sort of a long-term vision about what, how this is all going to, how the energy initiative and the development of energy is going to unfold in our state and that you, you know, when you, when you sit there uh, on the commission, you, you look ahead. You look way, way down the road and ask yourself, how is this going to fit in a larger development going forward? Do you? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think we both internally and what we've asked of a lot of the regulated entities are to lay out a lot of those plans analysis, um, you know, painting that longer term picture, but at the same, same time things change, um, technology changes, so we remain flexible and stay focused. I mean, at the end of the day, we, our, you know, our decisions usually have a near term focus. You know, what's the next pro, I mean, do, if we approve this project, is it gonna go on the ground in the next year? What's, what changes to programs or new programs are we gonna introduce? But I think, um, one of the skills to have is to see how those individual decisions fit into the bigger picture that you're talking about, both you know, within the, the context of decisions for this company, or does it fit within the larger energy landscape within the state, within the state's landscape. So I, I think that was something that I, I watched uh, fellow commissioners do when I was on staff and something that you know, I've tried to bring, I mean, bring, to, it, bring to the table myself. Is it, is it hard, Jay? What I mean is you're faced with complexity, sometimes contention, sometimes all kinds of new territory. I mean, you're cutting new territory all the time. Are there times when you, <laughs> pardon the drama, you sit, look out the window, and you want the answer to come to you? There are all these issues dancing in your mind, and you have trouble actually making the decision? I mean, is it like that, or is it just come to you easily? Well, uh, no, I won't say it. nothing. It doesn't come easily. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, the tough decisions uh, often have all those uh, attributes. Com I mean, a lot of them complex, um, you know, they're long term implications, oftentimes, many times controversial. Uh, and I think it's just you, you, we do the best we can with the information we have. Um, I do. I do spend a lot of time thinking about what the right thing to do is, um, but at the same time, we can't, you know, spend our time thinking about. I mean, there's a there's a time dimension to this where the time matters, and so we we. At the end of the day, we you know we ask our staff to review things, provide recommendations, and 
you know, I work with my colleagues and review those and, and debate and discuss them by ourselves. And at the end of the day, we make a decision. Um, have, have, are you overworked? What I mean is, how's your workload? I mean, uh, you say you worked hard. Is that, does that mean, you know, too much? Does it mean that you're staying too late? I mean, what's it like? Because, you know, we all may want to apply for this job, you know. Oh, uh, well, if you guys have, you know, we can take <laughs> resumes here. I'll take them back to the office. Uh, look, we, I mean, we've been fortunate. We have been able to staff up. I think we are near kind of our full allotment um, of positions. And again, I, I said earlier, we've, we've been fortunate to hire good young people. Um, but our workload has, has increased. I was talking before the show. I, I had to double check before I came over. We have 11 active rate cases before us. And, you know, these are very time-consuming, complicated endeavors. Uh, so that by itself is, takes a lot of time and effort. Um, so we're, you know, we're, our staff, it's one of the, the hardest working groups of people that I have ever worked with. Um, you know, uh, no matter what the sector. And you, do you take it home? Um, I work pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you talk about rate cases, and I, you know, and you've distinguished it twice already in this short discussion. And I, and I really wonder if you could tell people what, what is a rate case and why is a rate case different from other cases, other decisions that you have to make at the PUC? Sure, yeah, I can, I can speak generally about it. You know, this is, um, Traditionally, what it, what you would be referred to is a lot of the bread and butter of of regulated utilities. Um, so the, the utility comes in, uh, they they say that we believe it'll cost us X amount of money to provide service to our customers. There's it's an estimate for a year. Uh, the consumer advocates office is a is always a party to these cases. They they have a profession their their professional staff consultants review all and this you know on uh, for our bigger utilities there's binder we have we have, I have walls of binders full of all the detailed estimates of what it it costs to run their business as well as you know they they're asking for an adequate return on their capital uh, for capital invested by the company and the consumers at the consumer advocates office reviews all that information uh, is oftentimes you know involved in extensive negotiations in potentially trying to settle on on the rate request. It's almost always a, a request for a rate increase. Uh, the commission will, you know, review all that information. There's there's the questions asked of the parties. And it, again, at the end of the day, we make a decision. And that decision establishes basically uh, how much the utilities can collect to run their operations and, and how they do that. Uh, so it, it establishes the, the rates that the utilities can charge customers. Aside from you know, the, the, the business affairs of the utility, what it's costing them to generate or otherwise produce and deliver that electrical energy, are there any other factors? I mean, I mean the, the issue often seems to be whether people can afford it, uh, whether there's going to be political pushback. Because, you know, in my own mind, the distinction between the rate case and all the other cases is the rate case has an immediate effect on my electric bill. It has an immediate effect don't. on, <laughs> well, and so uh, did a calculation. Roughly, the cases before us, you know, the annual revenues of all those companies are about two and a quarter billion dollars. So this is a significant amount of money that affects the cost of living for all residents and businesses here. Uh, so it's and, and our, our job in this is to balance both you know, to determine what are just and reasonable rates for the service for, for the service provided, but also allow for the opportunities for the companies to earn a reasonable return on their capital. So that they need to cover their costs um, to invest in the, in their systems. They they need to remain an attractive place to invest capital, but we can't you know burden customers with unreasonable rates. It's complex. And so it's, it's a, there's a balancing act of all those, uh, those factors. Um, they're often, you know, very, can be very contentious because exactly at the end of the day, you know, there's an ask to increase everyone's rates. And they never come in and ask for a reduction. <laughs> well, what's interesting in this most recent rounds with the impact of the recently enacted tax reform um, where those, you know, those tax rates are factored into rates, they're, they're considered a pass-through. 
uh, with the impact of the reduction is basically offset the negotiated settlements. And I think in the, the recent settlement with Hawaiian Electric, the net uh, the net impact is a very is a slight decrease of about seventy five cents a month per customer. So that's built into the the, the rate. Uh, that, the after all these kind of factors get it, after the settlement came in and the, and the the impact of the tax reform was factored in. So there was a you know an agreed to increase and then the the tax reform has uh, offset that. And White Electric or uh, White Electric Light Company filed a motion yesterday asking to move forward on the impact of the tax relief and it looks like that'll closely, largely offset um, the interim rate cr increase that we granted in, in August. So it, the reason I say it's not always necessarily an increase and in that, you know, when you read the comments, hmm. everyone, you know, the commission, why do we, why does it, we end up as a rubber stamp for all these rate increases. I, what I can say, I mean, the, we take the serious, or that we take the process extremely seriously because we know something that affects everyone in the state. Um, but it is it is that kind of complex balancing act yeah. that we're involved in. Jeff, you must have thoughts about well, this. I, you I you do. were on this issue for the whole time as consumer advocate. This is your this is your ball game in many ways. And, and certainly, our law firm is responsible for a number of those rate cases that are that are ongoing before the commission right now. But the, the question I have is, you know, um, the commission has has been rather harsh in, in its criticism of Hawaiian Electric. And, um, you know, and to, to the point where Standard & Poor, I think it was, that came out about a couple of years ago that said that, you know, the regulatory environment in Hawaii is not conducive to, you know, to, for the utilities. Um, and it's not just Hawaiian Electric. I mean, KIUC had its decoupling ap application rejected. Uh, Hawaii Gas had the four G09 applications dismissed. Um, Young Brothers came in last a couple years ago for a rate case. It finally agreed on a, about an $88,000 increase, or just a, a very small amount. But do you see, you know, when you talk about a balancing, is there going to be some a, a shift toward um, being a little more utility friendly, so, so we can attract capital in, in the state? Or is it the commission going to be still business as usual? <laughs> okay, Listen, we're going to take a short break now. <laughs> and when we come back, Jay will talk about that, right? Okay, one minute break. I'm doing this for the benefit of the, of the engineer because we need to take a break. Yeah. We'll be right back. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world so caught up in the confusion Nothing is making sense For me and you Maybe we can find a way There's got to be solution How to make a brighter day What do we do? We've got to give a little love Have a little hope Make this world a little better Make it a better Try a little more Harder than before Good afternoon, my name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at three o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists, both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Okay, we're back, we're live, and we took a break. Um, not because that question was, was <laughs> anything <laughs> difficult, but because we take breaks in the middle of the show. Uh, nevertheless, we're back now, Jay, and uh, could you address uh, <laughs> Jeff Ono's question? So, yeah, I took him outside and put him in a headlock. <laughs> and did... Well, so, okay, a couple of things. Our, you know, as Jeff knows, our, our active open cases are contested case hearings, so I, I can't speak to the substance of the the decisions, the, the open cases before us and, you know, pending decisions. Um, I did talk about, you know, as when we do this balancing act in these, I talked, maybe what I said, what I did, you know, what a consideration is making sure that the regulated utilities remain an attractive place uh, for investors. Um, there's been a lot of things written about the environment here in Hawaii. Um, 
I guess what I would speak to is I think if you look at the recent track record, um, you know, we are, these are all relevant considerations in our, in our balancing act here. Um, and, and I think I'll just leave it, <laughs> leave it at that. Good answer now. too. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, it, it look it, at the end of the day, it, it Companies do need to remain an attractive place. It, it affects the cost of their raising capital. At the end of the day, that affects the rates that you know they, they that we set and charge for customers. Um, for a lot, I mean, and these are all capital-intensive businesses. What we're asking the state, I mean, the state as a whole, is a is a massive transformation of the energy industry that will you know rely on a lot of new capital investment. So these are. All part of that, you know, what, it, what we sit back at night and think about what the right thing to do is and these very individual decisions, it, it, it's a factor, important factor. <laughs> well, you know, you. That, that really takes me to the, this discussion you guys were mentioning. It took place in the Maui conference uh, between uh, Jeff Michalina and Rick Rochelot. Rick Rochelot um, about uh, whether it's worth it, whether the, you know, the, the cost benefit analysis on reaching 100% because it's very expensive and it requires a lot of capital. Um, and can we, can we do that? Uh, or are we asking too much of ourselves to try to get down that track? And I, and I wonder where, where that policy point fits. And I, let me add one point. I, I came from, back from Australia and I went to Melbourne. In Melbourne, they have these trams and uh, the trams are free and they have achieved a fantastic uh, increase in the amount of business in the central business district because of the free trams. Um, and really the question is whether the trams need to be electrified. They're all old, see, the trams. They're not new, they're not high tech, but they're free. And they have had a huge effect on, on business. So you wonder whether it would have been, whether the benefit, the cost benefit analysis would have been as good uh, had somebody said, well, we're not gonna do this with the old trams. We need brand new trams. We need highly uh, high tech, you know, clean energy trams, whatever. And so sometimes, you know, the existing stuff works fine. I think, and, and maybe you, know, you don't need to go to clean energy to achieve a better community in some ways. I, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I'll let Jeff start. <laughs> you, you're the guest, Jay. We, we, nobody wants to hear what the former consumer advocate No, 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 come we on. Jeff's just being former, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a tough question, you know, and, and you know, when you have people like Rick Rochelot and, and Jeff Michalina from Blue Planet, you know, debating that that question you know um it just shows you the 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 level of uh, how, you know how we can disagree and yet you know there are certainly points that everyone can agree on we agree that we need to you know reduce our dependence on fossil fuel we we agree we should be more you know self-sufficient we should be less dependent on imports um but how do you get there? And you know, when, when Rick Rochelot says HNEI's analysis shows that at 50% renewable, that's when the costs really start to ramp up. And so we're, we're getting close to that 50% that area where costs are gonna start to, to really go up. And, and Rick's point was, you know, it, it has to be fair to everybody. You know, yes, they're gonna be costs, and, you know, but we, we can't just be incurring costs to benefit those who can put rooftop so solar on, on their, on, you know, on their homes. Um, it has to be fair for all rate pairs, especially the, the low income rate pair. Not, you know, I see it that way too. I don't know how you feel, Jay. So are you trying to put me in Jeff's position here? Well, no, but <laughs> I, you know, actually I would love to hear you take Rick's side. <laughs> well, look, I, uh, the, Two points. Then. Well, one, I, I we were talking about this earlier. We thought it was. We both agreed it was a it was a high point of the the conference. Um, it was a great debate between the two of them and their moderator Gavin Bade. I thought it it was um, most. I mean, most everyone stayed till the very end, and it was engaging. Um, but I look. I mean, in a few lenses on this. One, you know, I made the point where we're engaged in a in a significant transformation of the system, but at the same time, a lot of the key fundamentals are all the the technical and economic fundamentals are aligned with that. We're seeing continuing to see uh, significant improvements in solar and wind technology. Battery storage is right behind. 
We're seeing record prices. We have seen record prices initially here in Hawaii, but particularly as you look at new deals being um, struck for utility scale renewables on the mainland and other parts mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a, we have a lot of, um, I think all of the technical challenges that have been raised at some of these penetration levels, the kind of the, the optimist side of this is, is winning out um, for what you see in the recent deals. We have you know, a new large scale renewable procurement effort going. And so we'll see, we will test the market locally and, and have a good, a very clear idea how, uh, you know, in this, this, the next kind of the next point here, we get to the higher levels, just how costly that's going to be. On the distributed side, I think we're also seeing, you know, a lot of significant progress for both technology and how companies are coming up with new business models to take advantage of um, new rate structures and kind of new programs there. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think the, you know, one of my takeaways from that debate was that they, I think Rick said 50, but he also went up to, you know, it may be 50, it may be 80. Um, I think, you know, the kind of the fundamental that you see in, in the economics profession, you'll see there's, you know, basically the cost, at some point, cost increase um, for these technology for, for as you add more and more renewables to the system. And it's, I mean, it just where that becomes steep, we don't know. And that as technology improves over time, will allow, will allow us to push further and faster. Yeah. And, you know, we have, it's, we're, we have some time still. It's a 2045 goal. Um, so we'll see how innovation in particular it's helps funny us get how there. this is driven in a way this whole the future of it is driven by how fast the technology moves and how pervasive and how and how smart it is let me ask you this though if there's one case that you've participated in uh, in the past year or so that you've been on the commission well, the one that you know throws the longest shadow on our future that has the greatest leverage effect in Hawaii what would that be Oh, great. That's a good question. I mean, I think some of the you know, decisions on the planning dockets are important, both for providing kind of the near-term certainty, uh, but also the, the, the longer-term planning horizon and the, you know, those capital investments are expected to be, you know, these are 20, 30-year type projects. So they, by, by design, they have a long-term long planning horizon. And so we'll see a lot of the discrete proposals and projects under those come in in the next 12 months. So I think those were, I think those were important decisions. And I think uh, to get to Jeff's earlier point, it did send a signal out to the business community and the investor community that there's some greater certainty here on the near term path ahead. And I, I think that's something people were asking for and, and, and interested in. Mm. A couple of the small points, uh, well, not so small. Um, is, uh, is cybersecurity. Two weeks ago, there was an article in the Times that had spread throughout, you know, the media in the country uh, to express concern about Russian tampering with utility uh, utility equipment, utility plants, generation plants all around the country, um, and suggesting that there were many plants that had been compromised. I, I don't know exactly which ones. I don't think they said exactly which ones, um, but um, that that's of some concern because. Just, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking what would happen if we had no power and we woke up one morning. <laughs> it would be bad. So the question is, um, you know, what, what is happening as far as you're aware, as far as the PUC is aware, um, to deal with that possibility um, and to be resilient about it? So I can, I mean, it's a, when I think about some, I mean, some of the topics that do keep me up at night, this is definitely one of them. Uh, in the kind of the protection of our critical infrastructure and, and you know, what, I mean, the, the services that are provided here in Hawaii um, are essential both for local residents but also the nation. Um, and so, we, I mean, I, I know through various efforts, state regulatory commissions have, have worked together to look at um, cybersecurity and protection of critical infrastructure at the national level. Um, we, we've... I think I can have been invited at a brief at an upcoming briefing about some of those efforts interaction with Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I know there's a lot of interaction between those agencies and the electric utilities and well all, all the kind of essential service providers. So I would say that's it's probably worth bringing you know some of the 
Yeah. I mean, the utility folks are actually the best prepared to answer some of those questions. I know um, when you deal particularly with their IT systems, it is, I mean, they're, they do employ a, I mean, a significant level of concern and oversight to this, uh, to this topic. Mm -hmm. One last thing, and we talked about this before the show, is uh, um, you know the organization of the PUC. There was a was a bill pending, uh, wanted a, some level of reorganization of the PUC. Is is it acceptable? And that bill has de been deferred. That's not going anywhere. Um, but is is the way it's organized now acceptable, at least to you? Yeah, I, I think I'll comment on a few things. One, going back a couple of years, there was a bill to restructure the commission, move it from. Uh, between agencies uh, where we would be attached. And, and I think that's been a, I was on staff at the time, I think it's been a significant success in that reorganization and restructuring and has allowed us more autonomy and flexibility to be um, attached to and, and but have a level of autonomy working with DCCA. Um, and it's allowed us to staff up, and so our I mean, our, our ability to operate um, under under that to me has been a significant success. And I, I have uh, said it to the senator that, uh, and because I lived it, I, I on staff we were we had trouble hiring people, and it, it was really kind of a it was very much bureaucratic, um, and we would make commitments to staff and not be able to follow through. It's it's really mm -hmm. really challenging. And that, so that environment is significantly improved. Um, I think we, I mean, we, we did, there was an audit of the commission uh, that was recently released. Uh, the commission you know, has, has supported the recommendations in there. So we will continue to improve on that front, work on our strategic plan, update the DMS. You know, there were some recommendations on uh, further uh, uh, the reten uh, retraining of, uh, kind of programs in place for retraining our new staff that come in. Um, so we're working on all, all of those things. And to the last, the, the, as I understand it, the bill that was pending has been deferred. Um, and, you know, we'll, I mean, we're, we're I mean, we'll, we remain committed to improving our organization. I, can, I, I strongly right. believe that. Bill or no bill? I mean, we have to, so. Okay. <laughs> Jeff, we're at the, that, that time which you like so much. <laughs> this is Jeff's favorite time in the show where he gets to summarize. And I always put it the same way. I say, Jeff, would you summarize? And then he does something else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, today, you know, we're, our, our topic of discussion was supposed to be about legislation. It was supposed to be a, a, a midterm update on energy-related legislation. But we had the honor of having Commissioner Jay Griffin here, and we sort of broke away from that, and I thought that was a good thing to do. Um, we got some insight from, from Jay on, on the commission and, and, our, and potentially our new commissioner, hopefully our new commissioner, Jenny Potter, who will be starting soon. Um, so this was, a, this was a great show. I think we should do this type of interview more often, Jay. Yeah. And we should have Jay come back. We'd like you to come back because you are very refreshing to be here. And it's great to have you here at this table. Thanks. I enjoy the time. Jeff and I are going to have to talk a little bit afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank uh, you, Jay. Thanks. Aloha. <laughs>